So welcome everybody to our workshop, uh, the DDC Gate uh, Digital Twin Platform Workshop. We thought about now, like after roughly one year, we've been up and running. It's time to take a closer look uh, at what is happening on the technical side. There are a lot of uh, development work going on, but to many of our partners and especially to external stakeholders, it's not very visible at the moment. A lot of things are happening under the hood. And that's why we decided it's, it's time now to have a workshop and uh, share a little bit with you what we have actually been working on uh, last uh, year. Um, yeah, we have decided to uh, have uh, this as a joint workshop uh, with the Gate Institute and uh, Sophia. Uh, if you don't know Gate, if you don't know what the Digital Twin City Center is, I encourage you to check out the websites. We will not talk about the, the overall centers here. We'll talk about uh, what is happening uh, with regards to the Digital Twin platform development, but not so much the uh, overall centers. So there will be no information on that, but I think most of you are familiar with uh, DTCC and GATE anyways. Um, and that's why we can jump right into this, uh, this uh, workshop. My name is Ben Ketzler, in case you don't know me, I'm the uh, center coordinator and I'm doing this little introduction before I then hand over to Anders, uh, who will then guide, uh, guide us through the rest of the uh, session. Yes, um, so the digital twin platform. Um, this is uh, done by our research area zero, we called it. We have eight research areas in the center and research area zero and the digital twin platform has a central role to play in our center because it links all the different uh, other research areas and uh, enables um, the input and output of data, so to say. It's important for the dissemination, for communication, um, but also, of course, we have our own research agenda in um, research area zero. And the two main questions we're trying to answer here is how should a digital twin city platform be designed to support and integrate a heterogeneous uh, collection of data sets, methodologies, and use cases? And the second one is how can the digital twin city platform provide an automated process to generate all data sets required by the supported mythologies and use cases from raw data. So this is what basically motivates um, the activities in, in research area zero. And we will today take a closer look at, on what um, both uh, people at Chalmers and the DCC, but also with the help uh, of our colleagues in Sofia, the Gate Institute has been developed and what the research activities are. And we'll do this in the following way. Uh, very short inputs, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, Anders will start on mass generation. Andreas will talk about urban wind simulation. Then Nikolai will talk about machine learning approach to roof uh, segmentation. Vasilis will give us a status overview on the Digital Twin Cities platform. We'll do a short break uh, before we continue then with Desi on 3D modeling and visualization uh, of buildings with CityGML. Uh, Anka will talk about satellite image analysis. Yepini will talk about uh, graph database for uh, urban data management analysis. And Stoyan will talk about uh, parametric urban planning. So quite a technical uh, session here um, and a very, very tight schedule. I hope you don't mind if we maybe use a little bit more of your time so that we can also allow some questions. If you have any questions, use the uh, chat and ask the questions there. Um, we will try to uh, monitor that very closely and try to react to the, uh, the questions and address these hopefully as well. Yes, um, yeah, we will share everything with you, um, the presentation and, uh, and the recordings via, our, via the YouTube channel. And um, before I give the word to Anders, I will, just want to do some promotion for the digital twin seminar series. So this workshop, we're going to talk about mostly technical aspects, technical development. Uh, in this seminar series, we want to look at the bigger picture a little bit more, the uh, strategic, uh, the big bigger strategic questions with regard to digital twins for cities. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, please do on our website, dtcc.charmash.se. And now I hand over to our director, Anders Lok, and also the lead for Research Area Zero. Mm. 
Great, thanks. So uh, I will be sharing my screen. I guess you can see it now. And uh, let's make it full screen and hope it works. Is it okay, Bant? Good. So this will be a quick run through of um, a topic called uh, LOD1 mesh generation in DTCC core. And this is joint work with Vasilis. And we've had some good input from many other developers in our group uh, to this. So thank you. Um, so what is the motivation? Uh, the motivation is automatic mesh generation uh, from raw data. And why would you want to do this? Why we want to do this for interactive simulation? That's the primary goal. And we want to do high quality visualization. That's a secondary goal. So the motivation for the work I present today is mainly to be able to support interactive simulation. That's like the dream is to be able to just uh, define a geometry you, you can move things around with your hands and you get uh, results back in real time. And for this to work, you need mesh generation or geometry generation, and that needs to be very fast. So for something to be interactive, it requires two things. One is to be very efficient or fast, so you shouldn't have to wait like two hours or overnight to generate the geometries. The other one is that it needs to be very robust. It shouldn't break. So if you put two buildings too close or you uh, you don't want to run into corner cases where everything crashes. So it needs to be efficient, it needs to be robust, and it needs to be automatic from raw data. So that's the motivation. So what is the input? The input is two data sets that we get from Landmeteriet, uh, the Swedish Cadastro Agency. And uh, the first one is uh, cadastral maps, like you see here on this image. So basically, 2D polygons that define the footprints of the buildings. And on top of that, we have 3D point clouds, which are just lists or arrays of 3D points that you get by flying over the, uh, the country or region and scanning using laser scanning from, from airplanes. So you combine these two data sets. You, we have this for the whole of Sweden, standard data sets, 2D polygons uh, combined with 3D points. And from this, you want to generate the geometries for the buildings. And in this uh, project, we talk about LOD1. So the geometries of the buildings will be like blocks. So you want to extrude the 2D polygons up to a certain height. You also want to model the, um, the ground. And we can also get that from the point cloud. So this is the input, cadastral maps combined with point cloud, so standard data. So then what is the output? Well, if you run our pipeline, this will be produced. So there's a number of JSON data files, that's our main um, data storage communication format, so JSON. So city model, what's that? Well, that's a uh, simply a, an array of buildings. They have a 2D uh, footprint, they have a certain ground height, and they have a certain height. So that's a simple LOD1 uh, model of a city. So the main, um, the main sort of output here is city mesh, what's that? Well, it's a boundary conforming tetrahedral finite element mesh. So that means that it confines, it, it conforms to uh, the ground, it conforms to um, the buildings, it's watertight, there are no overlapping tetrahedrons or triangles. So it's a very high quality mesh and it's a volume mesh of the air that surrounds the buildings. When you put the, the, um, the buildings or the city or the block inside like a cube or something like that. And then in addition, we produce some other output and I will just show you some images of what that looks like. So here's the main output, the city mesh. So we've cut through this mesh. You see it's a, you, we confine the city into a box and then we create a mesh of the air surrounding the box. We discretize the air and this is something that you can then use for uh, flow simulation uh, if you want to simulate wind, for simulating air quality um, or maybe do uh, an electromagnetic simulation. So this is uh, the basis that we need to make uh, simulations. Then we also generate something called city surface. So that's a 2D or that it's a 3D mesh, but it's a two dimensional surface. And this is everything. This is a, tri a mesh of triangles. You don't have uh, the sides, you don't have the top. So it's uh, not tetrahedrons, but just triangles. And this is what is being used by RA5. So we get this as a byproduct of generating the full mesh. So this is a boundary of the 3D mesh that we saw on the previous slide, excluding the top and the sides. We also generally can also look at the detail here. So you see it's a sort of high quality mesh. So the meshes for the buildings, they match perfectly up with, with the ground. So it's a 
high quality mesh that can be used not only for visualization, but in particular for simulation, where this is very important that you have a boundary conforming mesh. So it's a finite element mesh, but it can also be used for finite volume simulations, any other simulations, and this can then be fed into RE5, as we talked about. Uh, we also generate something called a ground surface. That's just a, a mesh of the, uh, the ground. We have a uh, single mesh of all the buildings. We can also split this up into several small meshes for each building. And then you can combine this. And this is what we do usually in Unreal Engine. So we import the ground uh, surface, the building surface, and then Unreal Engine takes care of uh, visualizing this. You can just put these meshes on top of each other and it takes care of the visualization for us. So this is not a boundary conforming mesh, but two meshes that intersect. This is mainly done for visualization. This is much cheaper to generate than this boundary conforming mesh that we have here. So we get that as a byproduct. We also generate a digital terrain map, and uh, that's a height map, a, a, a um, function for, of x, comma uh, y to z which is on the height uh, of uh, the area, ex uh, excluding the buildings and other structures. And then we have a digital surface map, which has everything on it, like it's, it's trees, it's buildings, bridges, all of that. And it's something we can, we can tweak um, by, by selecting certain classes of points that come from the point cloud. So this is also a byproduct of this mesh generation process. Uh, so I will have a five minutes, I think, to say something quickly about the algorithm. So the key idea is the following, that interactive simulation requires efficiency and robustness. But the problem is that the 3D mesh generation is typically very costly. It can sometimes be very fragile. So it's difficult to implement a mesh generator uh, that is both efficient and, and very robust in 3D because it's a hard problem. But for LOD1 and also for LOD2 uh, city models, we can uh, use a much simpler idea, which is to use that 2D mesh generation. That's very efficient and it's very robust because it's a much simpler problem. So the main idea then is to take a 2D mesh of the city that respects the building footprints. And we then layer that mesh on top of each other and we create tetrahedrons. And then we cut away everything that is inside the buildings and then we displace the ground by the digital terrain map. So we push the ground upwards to respect the uh, topography of, of the area. So that's a simple idea. So let me show you some key steps in this algorithm. Um, first is to generate a city model from the cadastral map. So we take that, we take the point cloud, we combine that, we layer that on top of uh, the cadastral map. We figure out which points are inside the building footprints that's done very efficiently. And then, then we can use some, some, uh, some standard rules for how to get the heights of the buildings. Then we do a second step, which is to merge buildings. Because if we want to have build, if the buildings are very close to each other, if they're sort of touching each other or within a certain threshold from each other, then we don't want to generate a mesh that has triangles that are like one centimeter, one millimeter. We want triangles that are like 10 meters or one meter. Uh, so then we merge by a certain tolerance buildings that are too close or overlapping into nicely shaped polygons. So that's a, a pre-processing step for the mesh generation. Then the main steps come here. And then they are first to generate 2D mesh that respects the building footprints. I'll show you what that looks like. Then we just stack those meshes on top of each other and create tetrahedrons. So then it will be like a full mesh of tetrahedrons. So there will be tetrahedrons inside the buildings. Then we displace that mesh upward with the ground. So we push it upwards. And we use that, uh, do that using Laplacian smoothings. We solve a PDE to on that mesh to displace, because you cannot just sort of push the ground upwards in a 3D mesh. We'll have to push all the triangles upwards, all the tetrahedrons upwards, because otherwise the, the, um, the triangles will start to intersect. So we do Laplacian smoothing to, to push out the ground upwards. Then when we've done that, we can trim uh, everything that is inside the buildings. So we take cut away the tetrahedrons inside the buildings. Uh, and finally, we will push the heights of the buildings, the roofs, to where they should be, because we get some kind of snapping, because we only have a certain number of levels in the mesh. So uh, in sort of step um, four, um, the buildings will be snapped to the closest 
layer. But then after that, we can pull them a little bit up or a little bit down to the highest that where they should be. So then we have a 3D mesh uh, for the whole uh, air region surrounding the buildings. So this is the first step. So here you see to the left, this is uh, our test case, Hammarkullen. And you see a detail here on the mesh. So you see that uh, the mesh, the 2D mesh, it respects the building footprints. So when we have that, we take that mesh and we layer it. So this is the boundary uh, of the full 3D mesh where we have say 10 layers or so of these uh, 2D meshes. And that will create triangular prisms and each such prism can be cut into three tetrahedrons and we do that. So step two is then to layer the 2D mesh to create a 3D mesh. Then we push the ground upwards. So we go from here to here. So not only sort of the tetrahedrons on touching the ground, they will be of course be affected, but the neighboring tetrahedrons will also be affected. So we push it upwards using the Pastian's movement. So this takes care of moving all the, 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 the vertices in a good way to avoid a mesh tangling. The next step is then to cut away. So we sort of take away all the tetrahedrons that happen to be inside the buildings up to a certain point, sort of the height of the buildings or close to the height. And finally, we go to here. So then we push the building a little bit up or down, depending on where they are. I think we put them, push them down like that. And that's the final mesh. So this is the mesh here is then the boundary of the full and final 3D mesh. And just a couple of words about the implementation. So the implementation here is part of what we call DTCC core. It's a C++ code that takes care of most of the processing, data processing that we do, input, output, generation of geometries and so on. This is an open source code. It's on GitLab, everyone can access it. Uh, we're using quite a, very few external libraries except for reading and writing data. We're using Triangle uh, for 2D mesh generation. That's creating the 2D mesh. It's a very fast and efficient and simple 2D mesh generator. Uh, we're using Phoenix, an open source library for doing the PD based uh, mesh smoothing. So that then, then we can solve this equation that we need to solve for displacing uh, the mesh in, in an efficient way. We use, uh, make efficient use of bounding box trees for collision detection. So for example, when we say we have uh, 10 million points in the point cloud, then we have uh, 10,000 buildings. And then we need to want to know for each building, which points are inside each building. So then you can do that in a naive way, or you can do it efficiently by creating two uh, search trees and colliding those two search trees. Uh, and now it, I mean, we can, we can uh, improve this further, but this test case I showed runs in about 10 seconds plus a bit more for reading and writing data. Uh, so it's not real time yet, but I mean, we want to get this down to say one second to generate a, a, a mesh of this kind. Uh, how to use it. Uh, so you can look at these slides later. You download the source code from, uh, from GitLab. Unless you need to finish. Yeah. Uh, so then I would just say you, it's, uh, you should be able to now after this talk, you can, if you want to try this out, you can follow these instructions ask us for help, but it's, it's really quite standard. Download the code, build the code using standard instructions and just run these test programs to generate uh, all the, the data that I showed today. Okay, that's, that's it. Are there any questions uh, in the chat part? Yes, there are, but uh, Vasilis is actually answering all of them. I think. Okay, good. So <laughs> keep on doing that Vasilis. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can also jump into the chat now. So maybe we should move on to the next uh, speaker, which is Andreas. So I will stop my sharing. Great, thanks. Yeah, we'll jump into So. Okay, thank you, Log. So my name is Andreas Mack. I come from uh, from Office Chalmers Research Center, where we develop a flow software called Iboflow. And uh, Iboflow is a general flow solver that we use for city simulation in this context, but we can do many other things. And the general feature of Iboflow is that we use 
immerse boundary methods to efficiently handle objects here. Anders Logg and his team has done uh, terrific work to generate these surface meshes, so he's made it rather easy for us, which is very nice. But in general, the world doesn't really look like this, that you get these nice surface meshes. So we have uh, worked a lot on being able to, to handle the input in a, in a e easy way. So it should be a more like plug and play fluid flow software. And it has been used for multi-physics application, including conjugated heat transfer, which is also good with the city simulation as we would like to be able to simulate on the, in, in the next steps, I mean, the, the heating up of the city with local heat irons, et cetera. We also use, we would like to have a very fast simulation tool. So we utilize the graphic cards a lot to be able to perform high performance simulation of large city areas on a single workstation. The software is therefore not developed for large clusters, developed to really utilize what you can have underneath the, your desk. So that makes it rather, white light. And uh, further, we have coupled IboFlow to other simulations too for fluid structure interaction. We couple it to our in-house in solver last film that utilizes uh, for structure and dynamics and also for discrete element modeling where we're simulating many coupled uh, particles and also it's used in a source system commercial tool for electronics cooling. So we've been developing this in around 13 years. So let's go to the workflow that Anders Log described earlier. <clears throat> what he described was that he import the data from the Bateriet, and from this within the research area zero, you can then generate these very nice surface meshes, which you see I've seen in his slides, but also in the top right. The next step is then to be able to automatically perform a CFD simulation of the wind, air pollution, etc. And that is then the coupling where IWFlow comes into play. What you do then, you can export this city JSON format, this 2D surface mesh to IWFlow. Then you can add meteorological data like windrows, etc. And then you can perform the CFD simulation inside IWFlow. So here's an example simulation of that. You can see the streamlines around the Chalmers campus. And then the next step is really to export the data back to the Digital Twin City platform so they can do this very nice visualization within the, the game menu, Unreal. And of course, there's also in the simulation, there is a lot of data. And the question is, how should we extract the data? I mean, what, what type of of decision to support should be give to the stakeholders. I mean, there is, you, you would like to have numbers on how, how large is the ventilation in the city and different areas, etc. So this is really one of our tasks to, to get the research area one to define this, um, these measures and also then to, to implement. So what have we done then with IBOFLOW since we started the project? Well, we have developed a, a completely new module of IBOFLOW. As I described, IBOFLOW is a general CFD flow software, but now we have developed city simulation, which is a simple part of IBOFLOW where you can set up a city simulation with a simple XML file, which is just a couple of lines long. So it's very simple to perform a simulation. We have added the city JSON format to be able to read directly the mesh format from the deal to the twin platform. So you don't have to go in between format that you had to do before. You had to export it to VTK and then from, you can read it in. But now we have a seamless integration with the Digital Twin platform, which is, which is a really nice milestone. In the beginning, we had to handle self-intersecting meshes. We had the buildings and the ground that were intersecting. But now we have a nice mesh, but we have developed tools to be able to handle if the meshes are intersecting, so we can handle that as well. And with help of that, we can also automatically detect the ground. That is, we need to know, because we all have a surface mesh, we need to define where is the ground. So we need to find the volume underneath the ground here. That we do. And then we also do uh, post-processing because typically what you would like to do is visualize the flow uh, like two meters uh, uh, over the ground where you have typically your head. And uh, I mean, typical cities are not flat. I mean, Gothenburg is not flat. So here we can see the Chalmers campus. And what we've done then is that we extract the, 
the ground mesh and move it up two meters, and then we interplay the velocities to this mesh. In th that way, you can get the boundary conforming post processing to really see how much is it blowing around your head. We also add the general inlet properties to the to be able to capture. I mean the the boundary layer data that you get, because if you're simulating one part of the city, of course, this happened a lot with the air and turbulence when it comes into the simulation. So we have, we have implemented a general way to import geometrical data on the inlet boundary, both for turbulence properties and inlet. So this is done in a technical way. We just take in a general point cloud, and then we perform least square interpolations in this point cloud. So you can actually just set the points on one line, but still it works very good to interpolate on the full domain. Uh, first, further, we have added the translation and rotation of buildings. As Anders Log said that you would like to, in the real life, go in, perhaps rotate the building, move the building very easily. So we added easy support for this. And we also extended the export, so we can export the ADF5, <laughs> HDF5 to the, directly to the City Digital Twin platform, so they can read our solution meshes, we can measurement probes, and streamlines. And with this, we have actually closed the loop with, by integrating iWorkflow together with the Digital Twin City platform, which we are very happy for. So all the DTCC platform need to do is write this XML that I'll show you shortly. So what is the iWorkflow city simulation in this module? Well, it is, as I said, a simplified version of iWorkflow with a well-documented manual. And to, to perform a general or fluid simulation, typically you need a lot of setups and need to work with the meshes, et cetera. But we have, what we have done is to reduce the input to perform a city simulation to this file to the right. We just set, need to set how large should the, the domain be, or where is the domain you would like to simulate? What is the name of the geometries you would like to read? And if you would like to add a post-processing mesh, et, et cetera. So this reduces really the input to the simulation 300 lines to perhaps 25 lines. And you don't have to know how to program to run the simulation. You don't have to have a CFD, a PhD, don't need to be a PhD in CFD. And we have currently, some user group for the software at Charmes Architecture, and also together with Gate, Melan Dostin, and of course Vasilis, and also some people at uh, Chemical uh, um, uh, at Fluid Dynamics at, at Chalmers. Uh, we have done a couple of test simulations. We have you know, seen that we simulate the full Lindholman. We also simulated the full campus of uh, Johanneberg, where we also you see some nice visualization of the streamlines in the scene. So we're simulated, I mean, the full campus, and even though we have included actually the trees, so which is nice. We can, I mean, the trees are really, they are not boundary conforming, but even so, we can include the trees with help of the immersed boundary map. You can see here that the streamline really bends around the tree. Which is which is nice, and uh, I guess Anders Log will soon also be able to mesh the, the trees with a boundary conforming mesh. But until then, we we will use <laughs> our two. So I think we'll have to wait for that. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, validation. Yes, of course, you need to perform some validation. I don't have so much time today, but we have, we have identified a number of simplified cases where they had had. Uh, uh, small cities inside wind tunnels, and then you get some experimental data between the buildings. And these we have been simulated with rather good uh, comparison. And we're working now on, the, on our first article to get really to get Iberflow on the out in the literature for city simulations. So thank you very much. I'm open for questions. I can ask for them in the chat. Great, thanks Andreas. Um, yeah, I think uh, we stick to the chat, uh, works pretty well so far. Um, let's move on to uh, Doc and uh, Nikolai. So, Nikolai, will you share the presentation? Uh, yes. Uh, 
Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Just one second. Uh, let me start my video. So, uh, we can continue from here, Doug. Yes. Um, Okay, uh, so we're going to talk um, about, we've talked about, we've shown how to do LOD one buildings, which is reasonably complete. We are now, um, this next step of the project is looking at different ways of doing LOD two buildings from the same data set. Okay, next slide. The next, there we go. Yep, so, and my name is uh, Doug Vesper. I'm a data analyst and senior consultant at consulting company Ramble Sweden. Uh, I'm Nikolai Kulibarov. Uh, I'm a joint intern uh, from GATE uh, in collaboration with uh, Chalmers University and Digital Twin Cities platform, and I'm currently working on the LOD2 project. Yep. So, next slide. Exactly. So, um, here we're talking about uh, just going to show what we mean when we talk about uh, LOD level of detail. So, here we see level, uh, level of detail zero, that's just a 2D footprint. Um, level, by level of detail one, we mean an extruded uh, polygon which is um, what, uh, what Anders Log showed. Um, so next step now is uh, what we call level of detail two, um, which is where you see the shape of the roof of the building. So that's the, that's the end goal of this project. Next, next slide. Um, exactly, and we are looking at doing, uh, being able to reconstruct this building um, we primarily are looking at want to be able to automate it using uh, different data sources, um, data sources that are generally available from Latmetria and the data sources we are using in the other projects. We don't want to be having to go out and collect new data to be able to gener generate this for existing uh, buildings. Okay, next slide. Uh, exactly. So, and the pipeline is very quick. We're going to do building detection, detect the building, detect the roof, and then generate the geometry based upon the roof, how we detect the roof. But before we get there, um, there is one step, which is like a very important step in all machine learning projects, which is often glossed over in most machine learning papers. And that is step zero, um, which is collecting your training data, uh, which has been in fact a surprisingly large part of um, this project as well. Fortunately, the city, um, there's a city in Sweden called um, Helsingborg, which has kind of, which has made all their city data available um, as open access, open data, um, including LOD, handmade LOD 3D models of every building in the city and high quality, high, high resolution um, laser data. But so we are very thankful to them and we're able to use that. It also means that we can be able to publish the data. Uh, when we publish the paper. Next step. Next slide. Um, however, this are, there's still lots of problems. Um, I'm just mainly going to go through some of the problems, not so much solutions in this talk, but problem is we the data from different sources have a lot of different formats. So we have to be able to find ways of reading all these different formats and somehow pick and convert them all to a lowest common denominator format so that we can convert between everything and everything else. Next slide. Other problem is that data from different sources don't align geometrically. For example, here we see the we have the cadaster data and the um, aerial photography. They do not align perfectly. So we have to find ways of uh, offsetting one so that they align correctly so that we can generate, uh, so that when we generate the, our models, we are sure that everything aligns and the roof ends up where it's supposed to. Next. Um, data, data from different sources don't align in time. If we look at our cadaster data, there should be a building there. If we look at the aerial photography, which was taken at a different time, there is no building there. So if we try to do machine learning, uh, just straight off with like saying that this is a building, um, we end up uh, with problems. Uh, our, our, tra our model will not train correctly, so we have to take that into consideration. Uh, next. Exactly, and other problem is that like data from different sources have different resolutions and different um, type. Like for example, how big is a pixel in an image? Um, we see everything from 50 centimeters to eight centimeters. And we haven't done much work in this, but we know from experience that if you train on one resolution, 
and then try to apply that to an image of a different resolution. It will generally not work. You get um, very weird results. So you have to make sure that all your data is the same resolution. It's the same with point clouds. Point clouds can contain anything from 25 points per square meter down to one point per square meter. Um, it's working with more points is um, gives you more accuracy, but it costs more, and we don't always have access to high quality point cloud data. So we need to be able to work with low quality point cloud data, but that um, sacrifices, but that with sacrifices some accuracy. And we want to also, but at the same time, we want to if you have high quality point cloud data, you want to be able to use that as well. So there are a lot of way weighing off like how do we make a model that can work with many different sources of data of different quality uh, without it failing at low quality data or throwing away quality when we have high quality data. So those are some of the many problems that show up when trying to collect and generate training data for a machine learning project like this and many of the problems that we have tried to tackle. So, but we've done that, we've got some training data and now we're gonna start talking about the fun stuff. Nikolai? So I guess it's my part now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, as Doug mentioned, there are three main steps to the building reconstruction pipeline. The first one is building detection. Here you can see some uh, example images. Uh, the main goal is to separate buildings from non-ground objects like um, cars, vegetation, roadways, and so on. And mostly they're segmentation-based, classification-based, um, and hybrid methods. The next part um, is roof, roof recognition. Um, the main goal is to classify the roof into a set of predefined roof types, for example, gable, flat, hip, mansard, complex, um, and other types. Uh, and the other goal is to split the roof into planar segments. If, for example, the roof is um, complex and uh, it's, uh, it's a combination of multiple roof types. After we have the building and the roof information, we can move to the next step, which is the geometry generation, um, which is uh, mostly data-driven and model-driven. The data-driven approach um, tries to uh, extract corresponding points of roof planes um, and then generate the uh, roof shapes by merging uh, the, uh, the, the extracted roof planes. And the model-driven approaches, uh, approaches to um, extract building primitives uh, and then uh, fit a, a generated model that um, fits best um, by least squares, for example, uh, with the least error um, to, the, to the model. So uh, we have tried roof classification, uh, which takes in, uh, an orthophoto of a single roof and outputs, outputs the roof type. Uh, and uh, we have three classes, flat, gable, and hip. Uh, we used um, a basic convolutional neural network, um, and it performed really well uh, with uh, 4,800 images uh, per class after data augmentation. Um, we used a data set from uh, a paper uh, by Aledust et al. Uh, which uh, you can see down under in the footnotes. Um, but for example, if uh, we can't define the, the roof type, for example, if it's um, complex, it's not flat, gable, or hip, um, we then have to use another approach to extract information for the roof. Um, and we move on to roof segmentation, uh, which takes in an orthophoto, uh, which may or may not contain buildings, or uh, part of a building, and outputs a binary segmentation mask where um, each black pixel is of type background and each white pixel is of type edge. Um, this way, uh, we detect the buildings and we um, separate them into planar segments. Uh, the model I uh, we have used is uh, a pre-trained pre ResNet 16, um, as an encoder and a unit as a decoder um, with 200 epochs, a learning rate of 0, 0,001 uh, and a batch size of 32. Uh, for loss, we used binary cross entropy plus dice uh, and um, add them gradient descent as an optimization function. 
Uh, for the data set, uh, as Doug mentioned, we use the Helsingborg Open Data um, uh, that he generated. Um, and uh, when I uh, applied some data augmentation to it uh, with um, mostly flips and affine transformations, we get uh, 2,400 uh, images total. Uh, for the result, you can see that um, they look very promising given the small amount of data we have currently. Um, from left to right, the first image is the orthophoto, the second is the ground truth, the, the annotated uh, binary segmentation mask, uh, which is done manually or um, uh, semi-automatic. Um, and the third image is the predicted binary segmentation mask from our model, which uh, as you can see, uh, are mostly really accurate and look very promising, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, we have used the Helsingborg open data, but the goal is to uh, be able to predict um, and segment uh, roofs from land material data. Uh, the problem is that the data distribution uh, is different from the, from the uh, target data. Uh, and the results for the land material data um, look promising as well, um, given that the data distribution is different and um, the, the amount of data is uh, so small. As you can see, the roofs are detected and uh, the segmentation process uh, has started, but uh, we have to have more training data for it to be more accurate. Uh, and perform more optimizations and more experiments to uh, further improve the model. Nikolai, you got to come to an end soon. Um, yes, uh, I think it's the last slide. So we have noisy data, as you can see, wrongly or partially annotated images. For example, there are buildings um, on the image, but they are not annotated on the segmentation mask. Um, sometimes uh, one of the building is annotated, one is not. Um, and so on, which, uh, which makes the model uh, perform less, but we can, we can clean the data so it, can, so it can improve the performance. So yeah, for further work, um, we have to um, get the extracted roof planes and map them to the point cloud data uh, for further analysis and uh, geometry generation. Uh, and we are currently working on that as well. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Doc and uh, Nikolai. We're running a bit behind, but I think uh, we will just cut away from a little bit from the break. Um, now we have Vasilis actually talking about the current status of the platform. Yes, hello, let me share my screen. <clears throat> so uh, this presentation was, of course, the fruit of uh, many people involved. Uh, this is not uh, just my work, it's the development team of uh, the Digital Twin Cities platform. Uh, yeah, the team is uh, it's quite big and getting bigger. Uh, so I don't have time uh, to mention everyone by name, but uh, I thank everyone for contributing to this presentation and to, to the development uh, that we have been going through. Um, yeah, it's been a year almost uh, from the inauguration and uh, we managed to scale up from 50% of a developer to more than two uh, developers, full-time equivalent, of course. And we managed to add uh, more than 2 million uh, Swedish krona in funding, and we are currently involved in three national and more than five uh, autonomous internal research projects and uh, six uh, milestone projects, as we mentioned, uh, as we call them, uh, are beginning in DTCC starting March. And uh, as you know, we have a joint internship and a PhD student with GATE. Uh, we have been awarded an EPIC mega grant and the they want us to apply for another. And uh, uh, we have written more than 10 conference papers and we are 
in the process of submitting or writing a, another five uh, journal papers. Uh, I mean, just for uh, research area zero related uh, work. Uh, of course, there are many more researchers involved in the center. Uh, yeah, in terms of code, I think we have more than one uh, uh, 1.5k commits of uh, a mix of C++, Python, and JavaScript code. And for Unreal Engine development, Daniel and Orfez have put in more than 1,000 man hours so far. Uh, we have two master students and six bachelor students. And we have access to AWS resources via Chalmers and two self-hosted GPU clusters where we're running our CFD simulations at the moment. Uh, so uh, the development so far uh, as you know, uh, we have core, Anders uh, talked about it extensively. We have our, our Unreal Engine front end. Uh, you will see screenshots later. And we are now trying to move on for, uh, to the web to have a, a JavaScript viewer as well, since Unreal Engine has its limitations. And we are proud because our pipeline spans from concept design to actual content creation and of course, uh, research uh, publication. Uh, these are the slides provided by Fabio Latino, our uh, lead, our design lead. And uh, as you can see, uh, we tackle with um, uh, problem solving via innovative thinking, and uh, we are testing different visualization techniques, and we are uh, trying to work on collaborative design. Uh, we do a lot of uh, prototyping, uh, sandbox modeling, as we call it, um, 3D modeling. And uh, then we we try to move on to the level design, where uh, instead of the procedural generated surfaces that Anders showed, uh, we do some manual uh, tweaks. Uh, this is still from Unreal Engine, actually, to, to create uh, uh, to recreate known environments that uh, the audience can connect with. And for now, we try to migrate away from what it's called photorealism. Uh, and we try to do this uh, mix of conceptual and cartoonish uh, look. Uh, of course, we do uh, mm -hmm. user interface and user experience design. Uh, this is an ongoing project with uh, Trafik Verket. Uh, lots of iterations, lots of prototyping. Uh, again, Fabio is, is leading this. And uh, we have a separate pipeline that uses FME uh, to actually compare with our C++ code. Uh, Sanjay Somanath, uh, uh, one of the PhD students working uh, within the group, uh, uh, created this pipeline and uh, we go again from raw data to actual Unreal Engine uh, uh, based digital twin. Uh, many data layers are used and uh, lots of post-processing happening. Uh, but as you can see, we're going from uh, uh, just terrain data to actual buildings and foliage in a very automated way. And this is kind of the, the process that we follow. Of course, still early in process, but uh, I think we can say that we can create open-ended worlds out of raw data directly in Unreal. And like I said, this is a separate uh, pipeline from the C++ code. And of course, we do a lot of uh, data visualization. Uh, uh, Daniel Hoyer from uh, Hook School Invest is working with us as well in this. Uh, this is his work mainly. Um, lots of uh, different ways to visualize scientific data. Uh, we use the particle system from Unreal Engine and uh, we do procedural meshing as well. But for, for performance based uh, visualization, we feel that the particle system has been uh, proved to be way more flexible. And of course, it's GPU accelerated. Uh, and we use pretty much the same process to, to do the road network and the streamlines, the, the CFD uh, wind flow simulation streamlines uh, coming from uh, IboFlow, as we mentioned. And uh, the road network uh, can be actually is connected 
directly to traffic circuit uh, in an offline manner, of course. And uh, hopefully, as I mentioned in the chat, we could connect to their API, the traffic circuit and or the land material in the near future so we can directly recreate worlds um, out of raw data without going through uh, any offline step. Uh, yeah, but if you ask me, it's pretty amazing what you can do with the particles these days. Uh, and uh, Epic thinks that we are a good uh, use case of their technology. And like I said, we have been awarded the Epic Mega Grant for it. Uh, and like I said, we have migrated on the web as well. Um, Andreas Rudeno has held out, helped out a lot from Strusoft in, in this uh, development pipeline. We have... Uh, three or four different versions of this JavaScript viewer based on Babylon JS, Mapbox, and other tools. And we, we strive to connect this to the research modules, for example, Iboflow, and then uh, to what and uh, Andres mentioned, uh, this procedural way, an interactive way of manipulating the geometry. So you can move buildings around and run another simulation, a road, uh, uh, network simulation or a CFD simulation, everything hosted uh, on the cloud and accessible through a web app. Um, yeah, these are more screenshots of the of the viewer. This is uh, Central Gothenburg with the districts actually shown. Um, yeah, this is exactly the same. Uh, this was made for the building stock uh, modeling group in in Chalmers, one of the uh, internal projects that we have been working on, and. Uh, yeah, what's next? Uh, we have, as I said, six milestone projects, very different, but all should be uh, included in the platform. So lots of tasks there to come. Uh, we want to have LOD2, as I mentioned in chat, uh, in our core uh, C++ code. So not just flat rooftops, but uh, something way more complicated. And uh, the dream is uh, real-time interactive. So parallelism needs to come into core. Uh, and of course, we need to connect live uh, to the research modules uh, and to the geometry creation and the user interaction, both on the web level and in Unreal Engine. And hopefully we can establish a common framework with Gate. Uh, I feel this this uh, workshop today is a second step towards that direction. The first step, the, a very crucial and important step for us was this uh, joint internship and the PhD of Radostin. And of course, as people keep uh, poking us about how we do things uh, and uh, what's to come, we definitely need to publish more. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Andreas, Daniel, Fabio, Nikolai, Sanjay, Anton, Orpheus, Anders, Doug, and Radostin for, for helping out in everything and making this presentation possible. Thank you. Uh, questions in the chat, but I haven't been watching it, so I'll get right to it. Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, indeed, quite impressive what you have done and with, uh, with the team in this uh, short period of time. We're running a little bit behind, but we still need to do a break now, a lot of input. So let's meet again 5 past 11, and then we can continue with Desi. See you in eight minutes. We are back. And I welcome Desi from Gate onto the stage. Desi, the stage uh, is Hello. Uh, I will share my screen now. Uh, do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Desislava. I'm research group uh, lead at uh, Gate Institute, and I'm going uh, to present a work uh, which we did uh, uh, within our internship uh, program. Uh, we have uh, one uh, student from Technical University of uh, Munich. So what are our objectives? Uh, to produce a high quality 3D model of uh, SOFIA next uh, to semantically enrich uh, uh, the model uh, with the data from additional uh, data sources uh, and to use this model for simulation analysis uh, and visualization of uh, urban scenarios. 
we've started uh, to develop a CTGML compliant uh, 3D model of uh, district wasn't of Sofia. It covers an area of uh, 9.20 uh, four square kilometers. Uh, two small rivers uh, flow through the territory and almost um, uh, 30 percentages of uh, this area is covered by forest. So we, we uh, have uh, uh, different kinds of uh, objects uh, to model. Uh, now I'm going to present you uh, the technological stack uh, used for development, mainly of the 3D model and some issues uh, which arose. We have uh, three main data sources. Uh, first, uh, cadastral data covering uh, most of the thematic modules of uh, CTGML standards, such as buildings, green spaces, relief, road network. Uh, this data we received uh, from um, Sofia municipality. Uh, we have an agreement uh, with the municipality for data sharing uh, and uh, cooperation. Uh, second, the high resolution uh, satellite uh, image covering around uh, 20 square kilometers, uh, including uh, the area of study we have, and additional point cloud uh, data, which also covers uh, the whole area of study. Uh, the satellite uh, image and point cloud uh, data are used for semantic enrichment of uh, the 3D model, as well as for urban analysis, such as cadastral validation and uh, urban change uh, detection. Some preliminary results of analysis of uh, satellite data will be presented by my colleague, um, Angel. Uh, currently, the 3D uh, model covers uh, buildings uh, and relief uh, thematic modules uh, in CTGML. The 3D model is stored in 3D city database uh, built on top of uh, PostGIS uh, database management system. Additionally, we are working on domain-specific uh, city data model and the corresponding ontology in order to exploit uh, the full potential of uh, graph databases, uh, such as new 4 j um, My colleague Evgeny will show later some practical uh, examples. The 3D model uh, is supported on a Cesium ion platform, which um, optimizes uh, and tiles it uh, for the web. A web application is developed for visualization of the building model. Uh, it is hosted uh, on a Node.js uh, uh, web server. Physium GS is used for implementation of the web application uh, due to support of rich functionalities such as um, attributes display and query object handling uh, such as highlighting, map layer control, etc. Uh, we defined several use cases to show the potential of data collected and modeled. The first one is related uh, to urban planning. The main idea behind it is uh, to develop a tool for parametric urban design, uh, which Tuyan will present later. Air pollution simulation is our second use case, uh, which is closely related uh, to the wind simulation presented so far. Uh, we are planning uh, also to integrate uh, IoT data in the 3D model, uh, which is already supported uh, in version uh, 3.0 of CTGML. The input uh, data for buildings and um, addresses is provided uh, in shape files. Uh, here you can see the number of uh, objects uh, in each uh, data set. The buildings have uh, 11 attributes such as uh, cadastral region, function, floor count, about the ground, uh, etc. The development um, of the 3D model starts with uh, uh, the terrain modeling uh, since uh, it is necessary for correct extrusion of uh, the building's footprints uh, into the third dimension. Uh, you can see uh, the FME workbench uh, for relief uh, modeling. It uses uh, a geo-referenced uh, digital elevation model as input and creates a CTGML uh, 2.0 compliant model describing uh, the relief of uh, the study area. A triangulated uh, irregular network uh, is generated. The workbench is uh, divided uh, into two smaller workflows uh, at uh, the end. The main one is to um, produce um, the relief itself. And uh, the second one uh, uh, is uh, used uh, later for um, finding interpolation between uh, the buildings uh, and uh, the terrain. In order to uh, identify the exact position where the terrain touches uh, the 3D buildings, uh, an interpolation of the building's footprints is uh, performed. 
uh, problems arise if 3D objects uh, float over or sink uh, uh, into the terrain, as you can see on the left uh, figure. Uh, so the building's uh, polygons and um, vertex points of uh, the relief available as uh, 3D points uh, are used uh, for interpolation in uh, MATLAB. Uh, you can see the main steps of um, interpolation here. As a result, three new attributes uh, representing uh, the minimum, maximum, and uh, mean heights of every uh, building footprint are generated. And uh, this information is uh, later used to adjust uh, the building's footprints since uh, they are no longer flat, uh, as is shown uh, in the figure on the right. A family workbench is created created also to assign an additional information about uh, the addresses uh, of the buildings uh, to their polygons. Uh, there are some uh, problems where uh, the points of uh, the addresses um, are outside uh, of the polygon. So um, we defined the tolerance of five meters uh, to connect uh, uh, both the polygons and uh, points. A FME workbench uh, for buildings construction uh, takes uh, as input the shape file of the buildings and uh, additional uh, open street map file containing information about uh, one of the highest buildings uh, in the study area. This is a hotel. Uh, the open street map files is needed uh, since uh, the original input shape file contains a base uh, footprint of the hotel, which is actually consists of two parts uh, with significant uh, difference in the corresponding uh, heights, as you can see in the figure on the left. Uh, the open street uh, map file is used to obtain the footprint of the higher part, uh, and the transformation is performed to produce more realistic uh, view of the hotel's construction. Uh, the buildings um, are extruded based on the difference between the minimum and uh, maximum height of the footprint uh, and uh, the calculated uh, height based on the number of floors because we are currently don't have uh, actual heights of the buildings. Uh, one, once the volumetric objects are generated, a series of attributes are mapped uh, to the buildings uh, as it is shown uh, in the workbench uh, here. Uh, the workbench handles problems arising uh, due to availability of uh, buildings uh, sharing walls. Um, the workaround uh, is shown in the middle. At the end, uh, uh, the workbench is split into two parts, uh, one for the buildings uh, themselves uh, and another for their addresses. This is necessary because uh, the addresses are not implemented uh, as buildings attributes. Uh, they have their own schema called extensible address language. The final result uh, with all buildings and the relief is shown here. Uh, the 3 dcd uh, db importer exporter tool is used to check whether the models are actually compliant with the CTGML uh, 2.0 schema. The web application uh, visualizing uh, the 3D model of the building, uh, buildings is shown here. Uh, the following uh, functionality is implemented for user interaction. Uh, silhouette the building on uh, mouse over and show its uh, class uh, as overlay content. Silhouette the building on selection and show its class uh, function floor count and height um, in an additional information box. Uh, so shadows uh, depending on the current time. Uh, so buildings uh, in different colors depending uh, on their height, class, and uh, latitude, uh, also uh, showing buildings uh, in transparent uh, style. Uh, to conclude, um, I would like to make a reference to the next uh, version, uh, 3.0 of uh, the CTGML standard. Uh, this version includes a variety of new features and uh, revisions of existing uh, modules. Uh, this includes representation of uh, time-dependent properties and um, possibility for during real-time IoT data, management of multiple versions of uh, cities, uh, which um, uh, don't exist in the current version of the CTGML, also representation of city objects by font clouds uh, and others. Also, advantage uh, is uh, that um, the conceptual model is separated uh, by the uh, encoding um, 
uh, instances. Um, so we have a clear uh, separation allows for providing further encoding uh, specifications uh, besides uh, uh, GML. And uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Desi, very interesting. Now I invite uh, Angel to uh, talk about satellite image analysis. Angel, the stage is yours. Hello, um, my name is Angel Spasov and I'm a researcher for Gate Institute. My, my work is uh, mainly focused on the development and application of uh, machine learning and computer vision algorithms. So uh, this is about myself. I'll try to share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Yes, very uh, clearly. Yeah, so um, I've been working on the task for uh, building detection uh, similarly as our uh, colleagues in Sweden. But um, we took another approach. Um, instead of uh, building the whole model by ourselves and uh, searching uh, for um, for data uh, elsewhere, we decided to uh, use a, an open source pre-trained model, which is uh, actually uh, trained on a lot of data. Um, so um, we, as a result, we don't only um, you know, show a progress about um, about our building detection, but we are also assessing the transferability of a model like this, which is uh, very important. And uh, if we if we show that the models uh, the model performs well, that means that uh, future costs and uh, efforts could be uh, could be saved by using an, a model like this one. Uh, so uh, this slide was meant to introduce you in the detection of uh, buildings, but this was uh, already done by uh, my colleague Nikolai. So uh, yeah, the main purpose is to uh, classify. Uh, the pixels in an output mask as the image in the middle as a uh, building or not building. And uh, on the right side, you can see a model similar to the one that we are using. It is uh, a unit um, as um, used in, in Sweden by our colleagues. But uh, uh, yeah, and uh, what is important here that uh, the model um, the model uh, within the training uh, tries to uh, learn the, pa the parameters that uh, uh, basically uh, um, that, 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 uh, that, that basically creates an output mask that is uh, that is uh, as close as possible to a ground truth. And uh, this uh, well, these parameters are learned, as I said. And uh, what's important is that uh, they can be used for. Uh, for other tasks, for example, even in, in early layers, um, pa parameters learned are, for example, to, uh, to, to detect edges. And this is something that is used, of course, in uh, classification of other images. And, uh, well, this is the basic idea uh, um, about, transfer, uh, about transfer learning. We try not to uh, not to learn everything by ourselves, but we try to use the, the knowledge learned already by other models. And uh, it has a lot of uh, benefits as listed on the right side. Uh, we can create more uh, accurate models. Uh, we can, uh, of course, reduce the, the training, uh, the, the, training uh, uh, the, the training data needed. And uh, of course, um, it reduces our computational uh, costs. So um, we took our, um, our, our model or the algorithm that we are using from an initiative that is called uh, SpaceNet. Uh, what they do is um, they provide uh, data and uh, tools and uh, also uh, run uh, challenges. So they encourage the, the people uh, or um, the machine learning engineers to try to tackle different uh, problems. Uh, while providing them uh, with a lot of uh, data. So um, we took an algorithm uh, which was um, which was uh, one of the, the, the winning solutions in one of the competitions. Uh, so uh, we can be uh, confident that uh, the model is uh, state of the art. Um, it not 
only uh, was a winning one, but it was trained also on uh, a lot of data. You can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, it was trained on uh, across four cities and uh, uh, the data set had more than uh, 300,000 uh, buildings. And uh, well, one, once uh, having the algorithm, uh, you need, of course, the data to fit in uh, too. And uh, uh, we went on with uh, with the use case uh, for the Wozniak district, the one that uh, we are building also our uh, 3D model as a use case uh, now. So um, we first had to specify uh, what type of image actually uh, we need, uh, because uh, as um, our colleagues in Sweden said, uh, it is important to be as close as possible to the um, to the to the image to the images on that the uh, initial model was uh, trained. So on the left side, you can see different points that we had to specify, uh, such as uh, actually what uh, type of satellite uh, do we do, in, satellite images uh, do we need, uh, uh, what should be the off nadir angle, uh, what should be the sun elevation uh, uh, level, and so on. But uh, uh, once we had the, the image uh, provided by our um, partners from uh, VECOM, we got an image like the, 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 you know, the blurry one or the low resolution one that you see in the middle, which was um, an, an eight band uh, uh, multi-channel image. And we had another uh, supplementary panchromatic uh, image. So what we had to do is we had to uh, perform some kind of uh, pan sharpening in order to get an image which has a better resolution, a 30 centimeters resolution, uh, similar as the one that was used for uh, training the model. We had uh, to extract the channels because the model is not, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's not built on uh, all the channels, but only a few of them. And uh, we had to split the whole image, image that we get for uh, Walsman district in uh, small tiles with a certain size without losing the uh, geospatial information. Um, we, had, we wanted to have also uh, labels uh, in order to assess the performance of our model. And uh, basically you need uh, a very uh, well done annotation, uh, but uh, this is uh, costly and uh, time, time uh, uh, requires a lot of time. And uh, that's why for our initial research, we decided to uh, take the uh, cadastral data uh, that uh, actually had also a lot of um, inaccuracy, as you can see in the, on the uh, middle image, some uh, polygons uh, were, uh, have not uh, covered the whole shape of the building or they uh, were not uh, in line with the, uh, with, with the actual building. So there were a lot of problems and uh, we did a little bit of uh, manual um, alignment in order to be able to assess the model at, uh, at, at, um, uh, at the whole. Um, right. And the next step was, of course, to, uh, to tile this uh, whole uh, shape file into small uh, tiles, again, without uh, using the, uh, losing the geospatial information. And uh, these are the, on the right side, are the first results of uh, our model. What I'm comparing here is uh, how the models perform on uh, an image uh, from Paris. Uh, it's important to mention that, that the model was trained on this image as well. So we expected it to perform uh, pretty well on this one. And uh, on the uh, lower side or on the bottom, we see a result um, of an application of this algorithm to uh, our image. And we see that uh, it performs um, very similar in this case. So uh, this is actually proving our uh, concept and uh, um, it proves yes, we can use uh, basically a um, model learned um, on other cities or especially uh, this, uh, this uh, model uh, for um, extracting features in other, in other cities. Um, right, and uh, here on this white, I'm showing actually on the right side 
an application of, uh, of the algorithm that we have now. Um, so you can see that it can be actually already used for uh, validating uh, or uh, uh, kind of uh, analyzing the, the cadastral data. Uh, this is on the first, on the left side is the, the actual image. On, on the right side, the, uh, the, pink, the pink spots are uh, the shapes uh, coming from the cadasters. And the yellow ones are the predictions of our model. And uh, you can see, for example, that uh, a building on the on the top of the image uh, did not have uh, did not have a, sh a shape uh, a shape file or, or was not uh, um, was not in the cadaster, but our algorithm uh, localized it. Um, even though it performs on this image, the the model requires further tuning, and uh, this connects to our next uh, steps. We want to um, to train further our model, so we will still use the pre-trained model with the pre-trained weights, and we would like to uh, train further the model on uh, data from Sofia. Uh, we would like to experiment with uh, hyperparameters uh, to get a model that uh, works uh, even better. And uh, a further step would be to uh, try to, uh, to regularize the, uh, the geometries of the, of the detected uh, spots. And uh, yeah, that is, uh, I hope that uh, we will uh, make a close connection uh, now with our colleagues in uh, Sweden and uh, maybe uh, we, can, uh, we can use uh, our, our, our work. Thank you, that was everything. If you have a question, I'll be happy to answer it, answer them in the chat. Thank you, Angel. Um, next up, we got uh, Yevgeny. Uh, hello. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, maybe, Angel, you need to... Uh -huh. Okay, I can share now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see the screen. Sorry. Uh, so it's not working in this mode. I don't know what happens now. Desi, maybe can you share my presentation? It's not working when I'm sharing the screen. Uh, um, but uh, you should uh, send me again the presentation. I can download uh, from Teams. Uh, okay, okay. Um, where can I, let me. Or maybe if you want, maybe Stuyan can go first and we will uh, fix this because. All right, um, we, sure, yeah. we can do that. Uh, uh, I, have your, I have your presentation. If you want, I can, I can share it as well uh, now. Uh, or, yeah. you, or I can start, start first, whatever you want, Yeah. Yeah. Right, Evgeny, do you want me to start or do you want me to share yes, your presentation? Yes, we, okay. we can fix this with this. Yeah, uh, okay, send. okay, cool. That's fine. Um, sure. Um, just a second. Okay. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, cool. Uh, right, I'm going to be talking about um, parametric planning. Um, essentially, we've been only working on this for like a month, so um, I'm just going to keep it and brief and accent on the breakdown of the work and kind of the research tasks that we had identified and what we actually think the project might look like. So um, just a little bit of background. Um, we uh, parametric planning really started since the yeah really started in the 19th century, 
uh, and it's quite an engineering approach towards planning. So essentially you view the city as a system uh, and then you kind of um, uh, assign parameters. Um, so city planners, they, they kind of assign parameters to the, to the system and they play around with them to find the best solution. So kind of from a planning perspective, it kind of unlocks creativity. But with increase of computation and new methods um, for optimizations, they, they can actually kind of, um, the solutions can be computer generated. So really what we found was that um, we have two sides of the problem. One is the domain knowledge um, side, which is really to set up the problem to identify parameters. And you have the technology side, which is kind of to guide the process, to de decide on an optimization, uh, to generate solutions and to to link um, the to link the model with existing data infrastructure and to um, increase the complexity of the model by enriching it with more data. So what we identified as task really is to how, how we can set up the problem um, to develop the tools for an optimization and to enrich it with data and uh, kind of use it within the, the platform that Desi talked about. So really what this is, is uh, an optimization problem. Um, and it's, it's essentially, we need to decide on a criteria or a criteria or many criteria. And those are gonna be our objective functions. And then we have to decide on what's the what the constraints are going to be and what the parameters are going to be um and essentially what we have been talking about up until now is kind of can we get uh, so far it seems like there's more constraints than parameters so we it, it seems that the whole kind of like the way that at least we've been working with sophia plan and the, the way that they've approached is is to kind of create more constraints and not really focus on parameterizing and, and kind of making functions, uh, fitting functions to data. Uh, whereas we kind of think that if we go to do an optimization, we have to kind of move more of the constraints towards the parameter side. So that's like an example that we were kind of thinking. So just, just, um, just kind of to give a brief overview, um, what we what we've been working with was kind of like um, an Excel spreadsheet that's uh, that uh, we've been given some basic uh, parameters. Uh, so there's already been um, a kind of a um, initial step from Sophia Plan that they've identified some parameters that they want to include. Um, so parameters, typical parameters, might be we want to have uh, all of the buildings that are going to be newly constructed to be within 400 meters from a, from a, um, a park. Um, so, and, and maybe there, there's other parameters that there should be infrastructure available to the, to the, new, to the new buildings uh, that are going to be constructed. Um, and other stuff like uh, the noise should be lowered and the, the slope should be less than 7% 7, 7 for example. So there's all of this. So, so for example, the way that they set it up, it's uh, the noise map, the, the noise levels are a good example of a continuous function that we can minimize um, and, and kind of use within the survey. Um, use within the optimization problem, whereas uh, the, the the public green area, uh, the, the green areas, the distance to the green areas is sort of a constraint. So we can kind of, one of our research is to kind of maybe put more, more on the parameter side and less on the, um, and less on the constraint side, or we can use constraints, but we have to have like a, a, a more rich model um, that's, um, yeah, um, so, so that's, so that's an example of how we can kind of move parameters, constraints to parameters. Uh, the other thing that the other kind of parameters, set of parameters that they've been talking about is kind of the infrastructure, links with infrastructure. So, um, so for example, they've, they just said there, there should be available infrastructure, but, um, but what we could do um, to kind of make more complexity uh, is to kind of say 
that if we want to build a building somewhere where there is not available infrastructure, um, then we can just increase the cost of the building and increase and kind of our criteria would increase. So that's so availability of infrastructure can also be kind of a, a parameter and not just a uh, often off, uh, off and on kind of a toggle constraint. So in the case of a sewage system, so there seems to be good transport and, and good water connection. But in case of the sewerage, maybe we can, there's some properties that don't have any connection to it. So we can kind of say, okay, we can, we can build there, but there's, there's going to be a, a cost increase. Um, and so, so the thing is the, the way kind of we, we see it at the moment, it's, it's very early stage, but the way we see it, it's kind of, um, we can enrich it with data. For now, it, it looks like a 2D optimization problem because uh, it just our we actually have to optimize for two parameters, longitude and latitude, and we are going to have a lot of com competing functions that are going to be added or uh, unified or in some combination of, of 2D functions, which which makes the problem quite simple. Additionally, we can uh, I mean more complexity can be gathered from the geometry of the actual buildings we're going to be creating and the height the height of them. So we need to distribute ground floor area for residential buildings, uh, hospitals, all of this kind of stuff. So we need to kind of figure out how this is going to go down. So it's going to be multi-dimensional. It's not going to be only two that, that's going to add more dimensions to the problem. But in, in general, what we kind of at least now established is that we, we really lack maintenance data. We really lack depth to the model, kind of, can we, can we do we know the state of the existing infrastructure? Do we know the, um, do we know the state of the sewage system and, and uh, what's going to need renewing and all of this kind of stuff. So the other thing is, yeah, I've already talked, the, the constraints are, are, are provided and we need to have more parameters. Uh, there is, quite a lot of static data. So can we go towards more dynamic data? And, um, and, and one personal thing is that there's really nothing about geotechnical data. So the soil, the, the you know, maybe we can make a function of, uh, we have a river approximate, in approximate distance to the neighborhood. So maybe that's gonna be flooding. Um, there's going to be flood issues with that high groundwater level. So, so maybe things like that. And it's a, it's a many stakeholder problem for the definition of this optimization. There's a lot of stakeholders, there's a lot of input. There should be a lot of input. So we need to kind of establish surveys to kind of ask people about the, the what criteria they, we need to satisfy. Do we want to decrease cost, increase sustainability? What, what's important? So that's, that's on the parameter side. So the optimization techniques that we kind of have been researching, essentially there's a lot of things that we can use, but in literature, the most, the most used, the most frequently used uh, optimization algorithms are the swarm, swarm intelligence and the evolutionary algorithms. Um, so the population-based algorithms are actually the most popular. Uh, th there are other ones, there's gradient methods used as well, um, but uh, it seems that the genetic algorithm is most used. So that's how, why we started with uh, the GA and kind of researching GA and kind of looking at what the parameters, metaparameters of the GA are kind of, can we kind of uh, test it on a, on a function with a lot of local minimums and things like that. Um, and and, and that's, that's what we are doing at the moment. Um, the technical details, unfortunately, you know, uh, we're still very early stage, but that's that's kind of what we identified as, ta as a task, looking at the genetic algorithms, evolutionary strategies, um, kind of comparing this to a PSO, um, uh, which is a swarm intelligence algorithm, and then kind of putting on simulator annealing, which is essentially gradient-based with a twist. Uh, so we've been working with Python libraries and kind of reworking them, uh, visualizing things. Um, so that's, that's the optimization techniques so far. Um, and finally, that's, that's just the last slide. Uh, we need to think about uh, really the connectivity with the, with the main data sources, the CTGML. This shouldn't be a task in isolation and, and the, whoever is using it should know that 
is, there should be input data coming in, especially if it's dynamic, there should be constant input the data coming in and, and the, the, the tasks of city planning is really complex. And the more that you have, the more you can be reactive instead of uh, proactive instead of reactive. Uh, and it should be included within a city, um, within the city platform. We should take data from the platform and, and input data into the platform after design decisions are made. Um, so yeah, so that's the so that's the um, problem in general. That's kind of the definition. Um, and yeah, that's that's my part. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stoya. Very interesting. Um, then we get to our last presentation now. If any. If you get the presentation sorted. Yes, uh, I sent to Desi. Could you please share the presentation? Okay, but uh, Stoyan should stop uh, sharing uh, his uh, screen. Did I, did I do it? Sorry. So, is, did we, I stop we, sharing my presentation? We are still... Um, we're still seeing your pictures yeah. from the last vacation. Oh, um, <laughs> and it, can anyone can anyone help me? In how do I how can I stop the sharing? There should be a stop sharing uh, button somewhere at the top of the. I did it for you. No. Yes. Yeah. It worked. of my presentation is uh, applicability of new 4j for urban data management and analysis uh, next slide please um, here we will discuss uh, why uh, can we apply new and draft data in urban planning picture on the left hand side uh, we have raw data from new 4 j uh, in the middle the second picture this is data that is enriched uh, with additional properties uh, that we have uh, visualized and on the third uh, picture on the right hand side uh, this Uh, yeah, next slide, slide please. Uh, why should we use uh, graph databases? Uh, so in the real world, we know that there are no isolated pieces of information and uh, everything is connected in one way or another. And uh, with graph data, or uh, querying um, data structured in connected ways. And uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, first, let's uh, recap what is a graph. Uh, maybe you know, but uh, very briefly, a graph is In a relational database we have also the relations that are links between mm, two nodes and we can in a new 4j we can have pro properties for the nodes and properties for the relations next slide uh, here we compare a relational database with a graph database uh, on the left hand side we see that uh, we can have uh, two tables to describe two different kinds of objects and in, in order to create a relationship be between them we need to create third table and make a join of three tables which is a very expensive information on the left hand side we see a picture of a graphical database uh, we see that we have nodes and relationships between them with the with the corresponding uh, properties and uh, one glance in the data gives us all the insights that we need. Next slide, please. Mm. Here we see an example electricity di distribution network. Uh, here we can see how we can model 
uh, electricity distribution in a building uh, and uh, optimize uh, the process for, uh, for example, optimizing the waste uh, of electricity. Uh, we can model here the um, electricity distribution company and also the different homes. And in real time, we can uh, observe uh, the process. Next slide. Uh, this is a uh, uh, transport network example. Here we have the raw data on the first picture and the same data that is um, mm, visualized with uh, a specific um, library for geographic information systems. And here also we can real time monitor the, monitor the interaction between the different transport transportation networks. Next slide. Uh, so here is um, what we do, actually. Our main goal is uh, to create a domain-specific data model uh, that uh, we load into New4j. Uh, our base models are CTGML and uh, Fiverr's NGSI LD, which is a dynamic model. Uh, the second one also we use to uh, make sure that we have consistency of the ontologies uh, we are creating um, and uh, yeah ngsi as, as i mentioned it is a dynamic um, model it models real objects uh, with a changing state like for example in our case uh, building city uh, it can be hospital school or uh, something else uh, also the data entity must have uh, different kind of properties like type name id and uh, so on uh, and the uh, NGSI LD, LD stands for linked data. Uh, it allows us to create uh, complex uh, relationships between the different objects and to make sure that uh, our data is consistent. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here is a sample of uh, our NS, uh, <coughs> NGSI LD in YAML uh, format. Here we can see that uh, we uh, for a building uh, we should have for example address the address should uh, uh, possess um, now should have uh, different uh, fields and the fields are also in different types like string number and uh, for the buildings we can um, list um, the type of the building uh, and through this uh, data model actually we ensure uh, consistency of uh, the buildings uh, we create in our database. Next slide, please. And here is the pipeline, uh, how we store the data into New4j and how we retrieve it. Uh, first, our base um, database is 3D CTDB, and uh, we export uh, the information from this data into shape file. Then we use connectors uh, from new for j spatial to these shape files and uh, to load the data into uh, r3 format which is used for a very fast searching uh, uh, on different geometries then we use our ngsi ld model to make sure that uh, the data is consistent and also we can enrich the data to make it consistent if needed uh, and then we use some visual visualization libraries like uh, Folium. And uh, this is in yellow because still we haven't integrated fully our NGSI LD uh, model into the pipeline. Uh, Desi, could you next slide? Uh, Neo4j special, actually, this is a library for special operations in uh, Neo4j and it is optimized for different kinds of search. It also has utilities for importing different formats of data and it uses R3 for indexing and uh, fast search, um, fast searching uh, algorithms. Uh, also, it supports uh, all kinds of uh, topology op operations like intersections, contains, disjoint, and uh, others. Next slide. Uh, here we can see. Uh, this is a query in Cypher. This is the language uh, of New4j, uh, the query language of New4j. And this uh, simple query actually extracts all the schools within uh, 300 meters uh, to a location, specific location. And uh, this is in R3 format. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, 
uh, and this is the same result but in tabular format so for example if you we want to create a report uh, we can to do it in this tabular format and export into CSV uh, or another database that is uh, relational or MongoDB or something else next slide and this is ex uh, in this example uh, we have created also a simple web application where we can text uh, where we can test our um, uh, the features we created uh, and uh, this is the volume map uh, and yeah you can see here we have built some filters for the data and uh, looking for different uh, for distances between different objects uh, next slide please uh, for the implementation, it is based mainly on Cypher, that is the query language for Neo4j. Also, we use Python Neo to access uh, and manipulate the data in Python. Uh, we use volume for, volume for the visualization and uh, CTGML4j, which is a Java-based library that binds the XML scheme of uh, CTGML and uh, parses it uh, into a, a graph. And yeah, next slide. Uh, here maybe we can point out our next steps. So it is to, to be able to compute, uh, we create algorithms to be able to compute distances between uh, different objects on the map, on the map, but already taking into account that uh, the person or the cars, they can go just um, uh, in some streets or roads that can one directional or bi-directional. And we also um, are creating algorithms uh, for um, uh, estimating the time that we will need to reach from one point to another point. And we are going to apply this for urban planning. Uh, uh, that what uh, the presentation of Stuyan actually, uh, where he described uh, the different parameters that we are going to optimize. Uh, we are going to also to use Neo4j and this application for this task. And we also need to finish the integration of NSGI LD model into the graph database. And yeah, I think that's. Thank you, Evgeny. Oh. Yeah, this concludes our little workshop here. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, it was really good to get some insights on. Uh, what we're actually doing in uh, both centers, GATE and DTCC. I think we will continue these uh, kinds of workshops, uh, maybe also uh, then uh, focus a bit on other researchers, uh, research areas uh, and what is happening in those research areas. Uh, if you have any questions, if you, have, uh, if you wanna know more about the specific research activities, feel free to contact us. Um, and we're happy to answer and uh, maybe also show you some ways to get into the center and uh, into the centers and uh, deep 